Hi, everyone. I'm Duncan Hollis, a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a law professor at Temple University School of Law. I'm here to discuss international law and cyberspace again. In my last DPN University lesson, I talked about using a mind map to understand why countries are having such a hard time applying international law to regulate the rising number of cyber threats we see across the world today. For those who haven't seen it, I highlighted the widespread use by states and others of cyber operations, that is kind of online campaigns that threaten all sorts of harms to economies, governments, and you and I as human beings. We then navigated through some tough questions states and scholars have wrestled with for the past two decades, when and how international law applies to state operations in the cyber context. And I propose that we can understand this situation via four things, Jean-Paul Sartre, baby carriages, horses, and Simon and Garfunkel. In my first lecture, I explained how the first two of these, Jean-Paul Sartre and baby carriages, stand in for the existential and interpretive debates among states about how international law applies online. I'm here today to present the second part of my mind map, the way we can simplify and differentiate the challenges international law faces in cyberspace by talking about horses and Simon and Garfunkel. And again, even though that sounds like an unusual tribute band, these two things serve as a shorthand reference that can help you round out your understanding of why we're facing so much difficulties in devising rules of the road for state behavior online. So let's talk about horses. Roughly a quarter century ago, a U.S. judge, Frank Easterbrook, gave a famous speech critiquing the need for new laws for cyberspace. Easterbrook noted that law schools do not teach a class entitled the law of the horse. Yet, Easterbrook explained there are lots of laws that implicate horses. We have laws on who owns horses, how they can be bought or sold, how you race them, standards for caring for them. But instead of studying laws for horses, Easterbrook said, what we do is we figure out how to regulate horses by studying general rules, rules on contracts, torts, property law. And from those general rules, we can deduce all the rules we need to know for horses. Likewise, Easterbrook said, we don't need a law for cyberspace. Cyberspace, he claimed, was like horses, an area we could regulate by extending existing general rules without needing to craft new ones or tailor-made approaches. Now, a couple of years later, Harvard Law Professor Larry Lessig responded to Easterbrook and said, actually, cyberspace is unique in many ways. As such, it requires tailor-made rules suggesting actually a law for horses in cyberspace. Lessig famously coined the phrase, code is law, to express one way cyberspace is unique. Now, in the real world, we have laws of nature alongside our national and international laws. And those laws of nature can't be changed by human beings. Whatever the rules say, we can't regulate away gravity or Newton's first law of motion. Rather, the laws we make have to accommodate how the natural laws of nature work for the human laws to work effectively. But cyberspace is what we call a socio-technical institution. It's made or coded by humans, at least until AI takes over in the near future. Still, unlike physics, computer code is malleable. It's flexible. We can regulate what is permissible or prohibited in cyberspace, not just through written statutes or international treaties, but by the code itself. The internet's protocols can dictate when and how computers can connect, networks can form, and how we transport bits and bytes. So as such, for me, horses symbolize the procedural challenge of how international law should regulate cyberspace. That is, do we like Judge Easterbrook, rely on existing general rules to do so, translating them into cyber context as needed? That's the approach already on display in a number of efforts, like the Oxford process on protections of international law and cyberspace, which I co-convene, or the Tallinn Manual on International Law for Cyber Operations. These are all efforts that seek to explain existing rules by extrapolating from pre-existing general rules, cyber versions thereof. Or we might instead look at cyberspace's unique features and say, we need a law of the horse here. Right? We need to craft new and specific international legal rules for cyberspace tailored to the potential and the perils of this context. And indeed, today, a number of states have suggested that we should just stay with the law that we have, Right, that we should not need a law of the horse, just as others are advocating for some sort of cyber treaty, 
whether focused on cybercrime. Indeed, there are discussions at the United Nations right now ongoing on that very topic, or one that focuses on cybersecurity specifically. Nor are states the only ones calling for new laws. In a speech made in 2017, Microsoft President Brad Smith called on states to devise a digital Geneva Convention to create protections in peacetime in cyberspace, just as the laws of war protect civilians in armed conflicts. In other words, the law of horses represents the debate about how do we resolve international law's application to cyberspace. Existing rules and standards are adequate, or do we push for new rules and processes to clarify or evolve or create new ones? Okay, finally, let me call your attention to one of the great musical duos of the 20th century, Simon and Garfunkel. And I mention them because of their most famous song, The Sounds of Silence. As silence constitutes my fourth and final challenge for international law's application to cyberspace today. For years now, states have been silent about how international law applies to cyber incidents and events. States, they've declined to invoke international law in response to specific cyber incidents in favor of a policy of silence designed, I think, to preserve high levels of their own operational flexibility. Indeed, even as states have begun to accuse other states of conducting cyber operations, like the US did when it accused North Korea of hacking Sony pictures, or later claims that China had been campaigning in commercial cyber espionage against US companies and their intellectual property, those charges, those accusations, made no reference to international law, let alone its rules or standards. Indeed, I think you can count on one hand to date the number of times states have referenced international law language in their complaints about what other states are doing in cyberspace. One example, in 2018, the UK did accuse Russia of launching a series of cyber attacks, including those targeting the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the World Anti-Doping Agency, and various commercial companies and in doing so, the UK did say those attacks were inconsistent with international law. Unfortunately, the United Kingdom didn't tell us which of these attacks violated international law, let alone which rules of international law were violated. I think silences like that may be problematic, right? Where states don't bring international law into the conversation, might it suggest these operations are awful but lawful? That is, or maybe worse, part of a new reality of international relations a reality in which individual companies and users increasingly pay for most of the costs of the cyber operations countries are launching against each other. That said, let me finish on a bit of a positive note. I think this silence challenge may be the first to be surmounted. Even if states won't yet label any specific cyber operation as unlawful or violating some specific rule of international law, they have been willing to break their silence in two other ways. First, the fact is they do appear more willing to object to cyber behavior they don't like. They may not say it's unlawful, but they are clearly signaling their disapproval. And that disapproval could help defeat any suggestion that this sort of cyber operations we're seeing uh, targeting all sorts of firms and even governments is being permitted by international law. And second, We've seen a growing call for every government to offer its own views on how international law applies to information and communication technologies. That is to break their silence and help establish what we international lawyers call opinio juris. That is practices that are required by international law. Doing so, I think, can help international law's application in real and concrete ways, revealing areas of consensus, but also just as importantly, Areas of divergence, showing where further dialogue and even negotiations may be needed. And I'd note another positive development. The first states to speak out about what international law meant to them in cyberspace were those, I think, that had the most capacity to conduct cyber operations. Indeed, the United States was probably the first to make its views known in speeches by the former legal advisors Harold Coe and then Brian Egan. States like the United Kingdom, Australia, Estonia, France, the Netherlands, Finland, have all followed with statements of their own. The good news is that other states are beginning to speak out as well, so this is no longer just a European or Western project. In some work I did with the Organization of American States, for example, we saw states like Chile, Guyana, and Guatemala beginning to make their own views known, helping provide for the greater generality of state views necessary to establish international law as a matter of customary practice.
In other words, states are a bit less silent today than they were a few years ago. Still, I'd emphasize we're still at a real minority of states speaking out, and the contents of what they say often remain relatively general. So we do have a way to go here before we can move from a few voices to an entire symphony. Silence remains the default condition for most states when it comes to applying international law to cyberspace today. So there you have it. If you keep just four things in mind, Satra, baby carriages, horses, and Simon and Garfunkel, I think you can understand and explain the four key challenges in applying international law to cyberspace today. Quick recap, Jean-Paul Satra, he represents our existential challenges, whether and which international law rules apply to information and communication technologies. Baby carriages represent the interpretive challenges. What do the rules we agree apply mean in cyber contexts? Horses represent a procedural challenge. Do we apply existing general rules or craft new tailor-made rules, a law of the horse, if you will? And Simon and Garfunkel represents the problem of silence. What does it mean when states decline to invoke international law in their accusations about unwanted cyber behavior? And how can we encourage more states to break their silence and explain how they understand international law operates in cyberspace? I hope that mind maps like this not only help you understand the challenges international law faces in cyberspace, but also help international lawyers and policymakers identify the key issues, the key sticking points, which in turn can lay out the terrain on which any solutions can be built. So thanks so much for joining me today. Stay tuned for upcoming DPN University episodes and other efforts to pursue digital peace across the ecosystem that we call cyberspace. Thanks.